Can you guys hear me? for like a good five minutes um, as uh, we wait for people to come on in. Should I do a commercial? Okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and get started, and um, so I've been, I've been toiling with some ideas on what I want to talk about, and I want to go a little bit more topical today. I've been um, working with a lot of new players, um, I've been getting a lot of questions on my ask.fm, so um, yeah, and I've noticed a theme on like what... Um, I've noticed a theme on a lot of common questions that I've been getting over the past couple of weeks and just some trends of what I've noticed, um, especially when um, players are starting to get beyond the realm of tech skill. And so I just wanted to explore some concepts and this is more, the, um, more so targeted towards uh, newer players who are... who kind of don't really see what's really going on behind the move choices and the subtleties of stage control. And so I want to just focus this on um, on just certain concepts. So um, one thing I noticed that uh, new players tend to struggle with is the idea of um, properly committing to a follow-up. And, um, and so there's two lines of uh, th things that happen when you um, when you're a new player, um, I should have reversed this. There's so there's over committing and under committing, and one thing that uh, new players don't really get a grasp of is pressing an advantage. So for example, when you have a uh, when you get an opening, um, so under committing in a nutshell is just not taking advantage of a situation with a follow up or just taking position. So let's say you get a hit or you get an edge guard. A lot of new players, if they're scared, they'll run away after after a hit. And so um, the games will tend to be longer with newer players because they're not comboing as hard or, um, or taking as much stage, stage position when they, when they have an opening or when they have their opponent in shield. So this is one thing I've really noticed. And so um, I just want to just kind of just... I want to just gonna watch a newer player match to... Um, to really just explore some concepts um, and just show where like overcommitment and undercommitment happen. So I'm gonna go ahead and let's go to a random match. This is a random match I just picked out of uh, two players I haven't heard of. Um, I'm being a little presumptuous here and assuming that they're probably not very good. Um, if you guys are, um, then I will be really I'll be really amazed and I will have nothing to talk about in this match. And so, um, and also I'd like to add that um, um, we are um, 
in the midst of doing Teas um, a fundraiser for Teespring. So if you really like um, what we're doing here on My Lay It On Me, um, we're gonna have a, we're doing a fundraiser for um, My Lay It On Me and Big House Four. And for some reason, the Teespring link is not loading, which is sad. Um, okay, there we go. So, cool t-shirts, we have 34 sold, um, yeah, so if you want to support us, they're 20 bucks, we're at 34, pretty sick, um, but, yeah, money will go towards, um, Melee on Me 2.0 web development and Big House 4, um, so, um, pretty exciting things, um, let me see if I can... get up some stuff of it. So this is Melee on Me 2.0. Um, so yeah, random guides. And if you haven't signed up for um, Big, Big House 4, by the way, um, I highly recommend it. Um, it's a great tournament run by Melee on Me Juggle Guy. Um, I believe you can register on umsmash.com. So if I go lower, you um smash, and there's a big register button right here. So everything is convenient and simple, and it's always good to register early so you can plan your plane tickets, and you don't have to pay as much in registration fees. So it's always a um, a great idea to to register early. So we're at 134. So. Um, my deal to you today is you will get priority if you buy a t-shirt so just let me know via email and then just let me know a link to a match that you want to get analyzed all right so I'm going to talk about the idea so this match I'm just going to talk about um, stage in, stage control and I feel like going with two newer players because they kind of um they highlight more just like missed opportunities in general and so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so there's over and under committing, and I'd also like to just talk about contingency plans. And what I mean by that is, uh, let's say you're in a follow-up combo situation and you miss your follow-up, like, do you have a second option to cover it? So, so I'm gonna also be talking about contingency plans. So. Um, if option A fails, what is your risk reward and do you have a plan B? And this is something that will separate um, good players, um, okay players with um, decent punish games and amazing players that have godlike punish games. It's their contingency plans because no one's like no one's perfect at the game and you gotta have a risk assessment. So if you miss plan A or you miss time it or you're late or you fail tech skill, um, do you can you cover yourself and still maintain control? Um, so those are the main talking points I have today. Anyway, so in this match, I'm just gonna focus on missed opportunities, and so we'll get started. So, so right here. He, um, Marth went for a really hard read, and now Falco has positional and um, pressure advantage on Marth. So we're gonna just restart that. So he gets an up air here, but it's not really the best spacing because they're probably gonna recover at the same time. But um, so this is the first example of overcommitting. Um, if you're, this is a wild gamble by Marth um, it, because. Falco is in a tech position, so he can either tech roll right, tech roll left, or tech in place. But Marth is not This dashing is offered for Marth because if Falco techs in place, um, he's going to probably eat a shine. And so I think to bail himself out, Marth dash dances back and hopes for a hard read here. Um, what's better here, if you're in a wild guess, is to just maintain control and don't overcommit to a grab. So. If you look here, like he's in grab animation for extended periods of time, and look at how much free space um, now Falco has to get away. 
Um, so um, choosing not to attack, if you know you're not good on the follow-up, just don't do anything, but just maintain position so that you still have pressure. Um, the biggest part of this game that new players don't really understand is that you don't always have to attack. And you can also throw out attacks not to always just hit your opponent, but also just to kind of just sheep them into a certain position or to force them to shield. So not every attack will hit. And you'll see better players, they use their hitboxes to make control. And with a character like Marth with um, really good hitboxes, that's something you should be doing a lot, is just controlling space with um, just good hitboxes. But he gets a good... Um, he gets a good power shield into a follow-up. Falco does it. Alright. So, nothing too bad so far. Um, so, I'm going to go back a bit. So, Martha's is actually not that bad, but... Alright, this, um, this is a bit, this is a huge overcommitment by Marth, and so the one thing you want to keep in mind is just good, um, is whether the opponent is out of stun, and it's very clear that, um, when you, like, Falco's already recovered, I hate it when the control pane goes on the wrong window. So this is good, but if you look here, look at how far away Marth is um, from Falco. Um, so by committing this far up, Falco is free to leave um, this way on reaction. So just from a positional standpoint, I mean, the alternative what you could do is you can do a hard cover here and do an up tilt, up air, um, and you'll have enough time that if Falco doesn't tech roll right, you can still go underneath and maintain this nice center um, nice uh, center stage while um, while Falco is um, stuck, you know, on the fringe. So um, so that's an overcommitment by the Marth, and so you, now you see that Marth is on the top platform, red equals bad. And Falco's not really in the best position here, but at least he can get down to center stage if he wants, or he can try to throw a hitbox if he really wants to. Um, so that's an example of an overcommitment. Um, so one thing you always want to be careful of is that if you're going to like run towards your opponent and you're pretty far away, um, if they're, you have to ask yourself whether or not they're still going to be stuck in the tech animation, or they're going to be stuck in shield. And if the answer is no, then it's it's pretty much you're doing it. You're doing a raw attack, and it's pretty risky. And um, somebody's calling me. Hey. Hey, what's up? Okay, cool. How much is it? Okay, sick. That, yeah, that'd be great. I'm actually in the middle of streaming right now, so I'm gonna have to. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. All right. Okay, so going back. So we're gonna keep going. All right, I'm 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 getting trolled right now. I'm sorry. All right, so so they're still fighting for space, and this is really good at the Marth actually. But um, if you look here, um, like I think just like from pre-positioning, like the thing about um, good Marts and um, Um, and you know, or just like, 
the difference between bad players and good players or like not so good players is like just the pre-positioning so um, personally if this is far if he's that far up um, there's no way that the Marth can horizontally counter it so personally I would have gone here and then because at least I could cover just in case the Falco shortens then I could you know cover that or if he goes on top platform um, then I could cover that as well so this was just a matter of um, pre-positioning that you know leads to good success so um, I guess um, in the idea of stage control that's like one thing that's really important is just being able to assess like you know areas that you can cover and so by going to position this position here um, you're able to cover this much space but if you go into um, you know if you're stuck at this you know position here um, you only really can cover this much and so you have a degree of space that you can recover that's like not as like good so um, so it's something to keep in mind I know this is really conceptual and these lines are kind of like obnoxious but um, pre-positioning you know will set you up set up your openings and that's one thing you have to consider when you, you space your opponent and in this case, Falco only has one move at this point, or arguably two. He could have upbeat as well, but um, you want to position yourself for success. And so that's one thing you want to think about. Um, so one thing I like about the Marth here is he goes straight down, and Falco is you know stuck up here. Um, in this red area, meaning that Falco doesn't really have like a direct hitbox or a direct really good route to Marth, and Marth can throw out um, you know these free you know up air hitboxes that can cover and they're really low risk, and so that's the importance of stage control. But unfortunately, he messes up tech skill. All right, trying to get this. And this is good. Um, a four throw is an interesting choice, and this is one thing where you just got to know options. I think the Martha, this is either a tech, this is a tech flub. Um, shout out to Scar, who loves to miss throw um, four throws instead of up, up throws and down throws. But um, I imagine that he wants to up throw. I mean, if you go for a fourth throw here, you're looking for a hard mix-up. And look at what happens when he goes for the mix-up. Like, that's such an awful, awful idea. And, like, down smash, like, he's in so much lag. And look at what happens as a result. So this is an overcommitted hard read. Um, I, I personally, I think he had to have, like, one DI and not tech to do this. And look, the tables have turned. All right, after this combo, like, Falco does some... And... So, I don't get the spot dodge. I'm going to assume he's, you know, new at tech skill. But what he did was he had center stage, and he gave it for free to Marth over nothing. I'm guessing it was just a tech skill club. And so you saw some overcommitments here. Um... Once again, more overcommitments. So, like, there's no reason to do that forward smash, to be frank. Um, if we go two seconds back, like, you can, you can, I mean, Marth only has so many options, and you can conceivably cover all of them if you have a good plan. Like, for example, if Falco wants to throw an up tilt hitbox here, he can do one immediately. And if Marth techs in place or doesn't tech, you get a free up tilt into back air. And if you see them roll right or left, you can simply follow them. And so that's an example of like you can cover multiple options and you don't necessarily have to commit to one. And frankly, at Marth's percentage of 76, 
um, you're probably not going to get the kill. So um, that's one thing I see a lot of newer players do. They go for an all-in that, frankly, is really bad. It's high risk, moderate reward. Um, and if you miss, you're like in a terrible spot and you lose everything. Um, let me see. So, let me get the form. Somebody's asking for it. And so, I'm really just highlighting just decision making. Um, so, the, so with the up tilt in place to cover the tech in place, um, the reason why the timings work is because the up tilt's immediate, and teching in place and not teching are the immediate options. And you can react to the rolls because the rolls have a longer animation. So um, you up tilt in place, and then you can cover a roll. I mean, that's how quick these options are. Anyway. Another questionable forward smash, and all right, all right. This is one of the biggest new player mistakes. Like, okay, so Marth is on the ledge. Like, why do you give up this much free free stage? Um, now, now what happens is. Um, Marth can get on stage for free with maybe a laser, but even if Falco throws a laser right now, he, he he's not going to be able to do much more out of it. This is this is one thing I see a lot of new players do is that if they see an opponent in a disadvantage, like they go all the way here, and I just don't quite understand why. Maybe there's fear. Maybe they're scared that this Marth is Mewtwo King. Uh, but even then, like. Um, what would be a comfort zone for me personally is just staying like right here um, if I were the Falco. And the reason being is the Marth jumps up and he decides to fare like right here. Like I can throw a laser and I could throw a forward tilt and I could throw my own my own good hitboxes like at this range and cover whatever Marth throws at me. If Marth, and I could throw a free laser even if he goes up and if Marth decides to you just get up right here and roll right away, I can cover that with a laser shine. So this is where, you know, just knowing a good pre-zone, pre like, helps a lot. So this is where I would have stood personally. But, you know, by going this far, it, I don't, I mean, it, it's something I see a lot of, and it's really cringeworthy. Um, unless you're going to play the Falco campy style, and, you know, you're really committed to that, like, yeah, it's not good. So moving on, so I'm just like looking at, I'm trying to look for things, um, alright, and and overall this was, I mean these are just tech flubs, I've already counted at least like a good 10, um, that's one thing you'd always work on, movement. Um, Pew Pew, um, I'm not sure if he can confirm this, but uh, Pew Pew, you practice movement for a really long time and just on his own, and that's why his movement looks so crisp, is because he's practiced it. So that's like another good tip I could give new players, is the fact that you can, is that to just practice movement, um, it, it will really show in your play, and in a game that's as punish heavy as melee, uh, making movement flubs will cost you sets. Alright, so in these um, three long seconds, or however long it is, um, you're either A, wanting to 
you either want to get a kill as Marth, or you want to establish position so that you have the stage um, by the end of your invulnerability. And if you don't do either, you pretty much failed your three second advantage. And Mango and will attest to like how difficult, or people in general will attest to how difficult it is to fight a person with three seconds of invulnerability. Because either A, you're going to get hit into a combo, or B, you're going to have no stage left by the end of the three seconds. All right, it was pretty good, but then um, personally, whenever Falc is on top platform and they're itching to um, get down, this is my little secret: is I like to just bait um, and just that and just um, I like to just dash dance back and forth until like they're gonna commit to a drill because that's what most Falcos do, and I just grab them. Um, you should. Unless they're like firmly stuck up here, you should really ever try to jump because it's hard to beat the down air. Um, and this is what the Marth does. Air Marth jumps away, and he loses stage. Good. Co oh. All right. Okay. Enough of this. Uh, nonsense. Alright. Let's go to another match. Alright. And I just want to just, you know, so we looked at two, um, I wouldn't like to say bad, but they're probably not, like, the, the best players in the world. I want to show, like, the difference in the idea of control between, like, a high-level player and, like, a, probably a mid-level player. I'm not sure how good GSO is, but just to show you just, um, the idea of stage control. So the one thing you want to notice is look at how like Mango will always, you know, he'll either be like in the center or he'll be beneath you. That's one thing that's always apparent. Unless like he has you in a combo, like he always tries to aim for that. And that's what most that's a really good philosophy to live by. Alright, so this is like, you know, this is where I'm talking about um, positioning for success. So Mango knew that he, he was going to be late on the direct follow-up. So um, rule of thumb, if you can get the direct follow-up off a tech chase, always go for it um, because you want the free damage. But if you know that you're going to be late and that they can get up before you can do something, um, then have a plan B. Um, let's see, I'm going to go back. So, Mango knew he was no good here, um, but at the very least, at least he's keeping him in this corner position, and hey, he has a hard read available to him that if, if this fox, um, if this fox decides to attack in, um, he has one hard punish that he doesn't really have to commit to. This is a reaction punish that he has. So that's one thing uh, that's always good um, if you're late and you're not in position, at least set up for the roll. I mean, it's a, it's a free punish um, at the end of the day if they, if they decide to roll. All right. So, anyway. So. But, and in a panic, uh, GSO rolls and Mango gets a free punish. And I just want to point out something else. Um, we see Mango on the top platform, obviously not a good position, but uh, Mango will quickly get out of this position, and um, GSO will have sh such a small time wi time window to um, you know to take advantage. So that's one thing that's really important. It's just like if you're in a bad position, and you can get out, get out as fast as you can, because you don't want to be stuck in these um, positions. And the reason why, once again. Um, Fox, the Fox below, unless the opponent's really good at shield dropping, um, has all the free hitboxes in the road, and the, the onus on him is to mess up, whereas Mango doesn't really have direct hitboxes to hit, um, to hit him. Look in contrast, um, this Fox gets stuck, 
mango catalyzes. So that's a diff difference between a mango and ordinary players, mortals. And once again, um, we see mango missing the follow-up, but he positioned himself. All right. Um, but we see the spot. We see Mango couldn't follow up, so he immediately, you know, sets up another position here. Um, once again, one roll distance away. And look at what happens here. Now, now Mango has really prime position here, where Fox is shielding. Mango has all the space in this world, um, where you know he can either just you know jump in shield pressure. He can wait. He can react um, too. So if the fox jumps, um, he can react to that. And so this is a really good position. And you'll see the idea of control and being opened up um, right here, I think. All right, he misses the follow up, but. Mango's uh, a little sloppy here. And I even just want to point out just this this, this edge guard. Um, Mango's covering a lot here, so and this is just coming down to timing. So um, you could you could go up at this point or you could go straight. The straight option is going to be a bit faster because of the distance it takes to get from A to B. Um, so, um, and to get to this platform uh, will take longer. So what he can, what Mango can do to just cover as many options as he can is to throw it up back here, back here immediately um, to cover the straight option, and he'll have time to cover the high option too if um, if GSO decides to go up. The only possibility really is if somehow um, he can manage a great angle here. So uh, just to recap, a good back to cover as many options as he can, he throws a back air here to intercept and then he'll land on stage and then if the fox decides to um, you know come up, Mango can also cover that in the same amount of time. So um, that's one thing you want to think about in good edge guarding. So um, you want to assess what options they have given the game state. So here um, the fox decides to up B and there's only so many options you can have and so Mango has a game plan set for this. He's going to start off on the ledge to deter him from trying to go for the ledge. He's going to cover the straight one um, with, a good, with a back air hitbox and if he doesn't do that then he can cover high as well. He goes low, Mango, um, it's like playing, I don't know, baseball, I don't know. And so right here, Mango is assessing what, how far the fox can go. So he's going to stay on the, on, stay here just in case there's a side B. Um, but then he sees that the fox can only get ledge and covers it. And so that's just edge guarding 101. All right. Anyway, so. Oh, actually, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a terrible, I'm a terrible, terrible, terrible person. He actually made it. So that was a misjudgment by me too. I, I'm a fraud. I'm Crimson Buster level. So I just want to sh platforms are usually no good and and once you get up here mango has all the control in the world and that's why like but part of it on why um, GSO was forced up here in the first place was just mango dash dancing and pressuring him into the corner so he really felt like he didn't have anywhere to go and he gets punished so I just want to just emphasize just 
how much like important it is to just establish stage control, and then you go for your punish um, afterwards. Okay, so this is one thing. Um, okay, GSO has like three seconds to establish control, and look at what Manger does. And in just one fell swoop, GSO goes for a hard read, and this is an overcommitment. Not necessarily, and it may not be apparent if you're just casually playing, but for the fact that now Mango can go down here, and once again, um, once Mango goes down here, he has all the stage once again. All the stage. And look at where GSO is. He has this little crappy corner where he can't do anything. And so corners, usually unless you're Muti King, you can't win this at all. Um, I'm trying to think of the Star Wars Episode 3 duel. Corny music clip. Shout to one of the worst. All right. So even in Star Wars, corner pressure is ridiculous. This this Jedi has all the stage control, and Anakin has nothing. See? Corner pressure is ridiculous. Anyway, so I digress. Alright, anyway, sorry about that. Alright, let's going back to the match. Oh, good edge guard by GSO. But, um. Yeah, I just really like this um, sequence by Mango. Um, once again, Mango in his invulnerability state not only gets a hit, but. Look at look at where GSO is as a result. He's gonna have to shield. He's still shielding, and his shield's getting really low. And he's getting, and Mango just goes in. I think Mango's just fooling around, but anyway, let's go to some real matches. Scar's uh, commentating this. Scar's a pretty good commentator. Anyway. So, I'm going to start working where, um, so, anyway, so, I'm, by critiquing Muti King, just giving a disclaimer, I'm not claiming I'm better than Muti King. Um, he's a much better Sheik, but that doesn't make me, f that doesn't allow me to, that doesn't prevent me from still being able to give critiques. And a lot of people have been asking me from the Sheik's perspective, like, well, like, what does Sheik really do then to be, um, Yoshi? And I, um, and 
you know, I think there's, I think Sheik, frankly, has a huge advantage here, and I think uh, Muti King just mentally broke down to a certain extent, but there are a lot of really questionable situations I just really want to point out in, in this. Once again, Muti King, ten times the player I am, um, so yeah. So, uh, let's see. So, Mita King is playing well. And the reason why is Mita King, is, um, Mita, Mita King uh, stays grounded. And, you know, he plays tilty and he goes for grabs. And I think that it attributes very much to him um, having the lead in both the game and in, or in the set and the game. Is that he stuck to a game plan of staying on the ground. And I'm going to show why playing in the air is kind of detrimental. So there's two types of sheiks. There's the sheiks that like to stand grounded, they like to they like to dash dance camp, they like to throw a lot of tilt, and they like to grab. And then there's the jump happy sheiks. They're the ones that like to spam back ears and fares, and they like to kind of play more zoning. Um, so there's a slow transition that kind of happens as Muta King, um, you know, goes from a more of a ground-based game to playing more in the air. And for what it's worth, maybe Amsa did something to threaten his ground space, and so maybe that's why Muta King felt that he needed to play more in the air. So look at that down smash there. Alright. Alright. I just want to just point out something here. So at 26, um, um, so was able to get out in there. Um, so this is why um, Sheik's chain grab doesn't work till high percentages. And this, I hope this example clearly demonstrates that you can't chain grab Yoshi to 100 like most people think. Anyway. But notice how, like, most of m now M M M King is slowly switching to an aerial based game. Look at how many fares he's th throwing now. And why is this bad? It it'll show. So, look at how many jumps M King's doing. So, it's kind of working now, but there's a high risk of this that will eventually manifest itself. So if you get caught in the air like this, um, you're in for some hard times. And and so that's why I don't really like an air-based game as Sheik against Amsa the more I think about it. Because it just takes one parry or one misspaced aerial to eat 60 or 70%. And I feel like this is where the minor rewards of getting a fair for 14 isn't good enough considering that you can get punished for 70 if you mess up. All right. And this is another part of where everything fails. A grounded Yoshi, there's nothing she can really do to compete with this. And you'll see it repeatedly in the set. Um, Yuzi King trying to compete with bad, with bad nares. And Yoshi can either parry or straight up just trade. And you'll see it happen a lot in the set. And um, it kind of kills me that Yuzi King didn't adjust to this or um, wasn't aware of how he's going to land against Yoshi. See, once again, um, you see here, um, all right, well, this is just good zoning by Amsa, so maybe he, he, uh, he forced me to King's hand here. And you can already see, uh, this is, there's no way that Muta King can really avoid it at this point. Like, the farthest he can go is arguably here. And that, that Yoshi is so excited to just headbutt him really hard and take the lead. And I think Muta King 
I, 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 I don't know. I think Mutant King probably thought that Amsa was going to trade hitboxes, and maybe that's why he went for a Nair. But it was clear that Amsa was just going to stay on the ground. And even if Mutant King thought he was going to up air, like, the up air will beat him anyways. So I don't know. This was really questionable. Alright. And I said this a lot in the commentary, but like, why why can't you do this for like 5 minutes and 15 seconds? Like, it seems unbeatable. And I... I... Okay, once again, um... I think to pretty much, you know, if you're going to fight Yoshi in the air, the only thing you really have to really be worried about as Sheik is that back air, and this is something that Amsa marvelously hits. And look at how much damage that does. 38, 49. And once again, look at look at the same exact situation. Yoshi is hungry for this. T Yoshi something, Goomba, Eater, whatever they name Yoshi. But once again, this is like... I don't know if the crowd got to him, but to me this is what I think is just lazy playing or lazy adaptation. I don't know what to call it, but I think this is probably one of the main reasons why Mewtwo King lost the set. is because of these lazy nares that end up costing him. And once again, like, he actually almost got caught again. So let me show you a little moment after. So there's a combo. Like, right here, this is such a bad jump because, once again, um, Yoshi is underneath to capitalize. And for Sheik in general, if you're playing against Sheik, um, Sheik wants you out of these 45 degree zones. Like, anything out of this area for Sheik, like, if you're out of the zone, this is good. Like, this is good for Sheik. This is good for Sheik. But if you're in this um, in this zone in the middle here, um, it's actually really bad for Sheik because any form of up tilt will straight up beat Sheik, and like you, she can't really needle. And so like Sheik, it's kind of like when Fox has it can juggle Marth or if Sheik. Like you don't ever want another character below Sheik like this. So um, just a quick tip: if you ever see a Sheik full hop and you're inside the zone, just run in and just kick him. Like, it's like the freest kick that you can get on Sheik. Um, so that's just zoning one-on-one -on, -one on jumping Sheik. So once again, if you ever see Sheik jump, just pretend that there's an imaginary 45 degree angle, and if you are in that 45 degree zone, you have a free hit. I just want to just point out something else too. All right, when Mutha King and Shield has been spamming a lot of nares, and this is a really marvelous adaptation by um, Amsa. All right, so they're in this um, cherry pick stalemate, and one thing that um, that Amsa's that Mutha King's been doing is he's been throwing out a lot of nair out of Shield, and so Amsa set himself up in a perfect position that. If Mutant King jumps, he gets a free back air. And Mutant King hasn't really shown that he's willing to roll or wave dash out um, in this position. So this was a marvelous, um, this is a marvelous catch by uh, Amsa. And once again, he's getting juggled. Okay, so 
in this situation, so I'm not sure if this is the first time that happened in the set, but Hello? Hey, I'm actually s What's up? What? You're going out? You're Oh, sick. Okay. Yeah, I'm in the middle of the stream. I, I'll call you back in like an hour. Alright, sorry about that. Bye. Alright. So... Um, I think there's like something about um, adaptation that was really just lacking here. So um, that 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 Nair out of shield, um, that Nair, that um, jump cancel Nair that countered Mewtwo King. Uh, Mewtwo King should have caught on to that, to be honest. Um, um, so the fact that Mewtwo King didn't catch on and he was getting punished in this game really maybe question just like how good Mewtwo King is at adapting or maybe he got nerfed um, he got nerfed by the crowd I mean it could have been many things but just for the fact that he didn't catch that and that's those are the little things you have to pick up So a lot of these things, although Mewtwo King kind of gets bailed out here, Mewtwo King is stuck in, um, in, in shield for so much, and you'll see him panic and jump a lot. And to be honest, I think wave dashing back and just maintaining like maybe like a ground space of this much would be much better than getting caught in the air and risking getting back air juggled. And on FD, uh, I can tell you that being a Sheik and having no double jump or getting your jump caught on, and you're underneath your, underneath your opponent, like, that really sucks. Like, whether it's Marth or Fox or Falco or any, any, any character that has Sheik inner jump like that, it's not good times. Um, so he gets caught again in the jump and he gets very fortunate here that he gets out. So the Nair comes out, and once again, like, these full hops are disastrous for me to King. And that's why it's like losing him the neutral. Alright, so he's getting frustrated by the eggs, but um, I just want to show once again. Um, Alright, full hopping Sheik. Yoshi's in the 45. It's a free hit. This is a free, the freest of freest hits. And this, this is why that was such a bad full hop because Yoshi's gonna get a free hit, and I think the back air will lead to more damage. And look, now Sheik is stuck trying to recover. Now Sheik has no double jump, so um, basically Sheik has to get lucky to not get hit because there's no double jump. Yoshi is happy here. Um, he is smiling, like really here. Sheik is sad. Anyway, and he capitalizes. Still no double jump. Two up smashes. And so once again, like one up smash. And this is how you beat Sheik, to be honest. Get her in the air and get her stuck like that. Alright. And every time um, 
um, so it hits a shield. Um, I agree that if you have a free Nair, you should do the Nair out of shield. But Mutiki panic jumps every time, and if Amsa, and if Amsa was a little bit more accurate, that would have been a free back air. And that's why he's been catching him in every time the neutral. He'll hit his shield, Mutiki will jump, and he will back air or throw out an aerial and beat Mutiki. Once again, the jump comes out. Shield grabs, but it fails. Um. All right. Okay, this is one of Yoshi's gimmicks that you have to watch out for. All right. So Muti King tries to go for the optimal punish here, but he doesn't. I don't think it's enough distance for him to get the wave dash out of shield. And that headbutt actually has a lot of stun. It's kind of deceptive. And the interesting thing about this headbutt is that it's similar to Raptor Boost. So if Yoshi's head was here, um, now his hitbox goes back here and you're going to whiff. It's similar to rap the Raptor Boost of Falcon. And this is one thing I learned from playing Amps Amsa at one of the tournaments. Is that Force Smash is that if, if Amsa hard reads that you're going to go for a grab, he can throw out that Force Smash and your grab's going to miss and you're going to eat a free Force Smash. So that was a really nice play by Amsa. It's a kind of gimmicky, but it's still good how he uses it. Alright, miss based Amsa there. And once again, double jump. I don't know what he's thinking here. Um, this is such a risky position. And he takes 17, almost takes more for it. takes 27 and this is just sloppy play by Mita King and a beautiful play by Amsa so it's a mix of um, Amsa scaring him desperation there gets caught all right and this is like this is like what like ultra new players do I would have probably done it in desperation if I felt like that but this is like something that Amsa pre space for he he can straight up beat the fair, like given the spacing that he has right now. And lo and behold, Mithi King throws it out and gets free uh, forward smash. Once again, another questionable full hop, and this is a reoccurring theme if you guys notice. And this is something that Mewtwo King can easily fix, so it's like, I think it's just um, strategic errors to commit to these full hops. And it's fortunate for him that Mewtwo King doesn't get caught. I really like this from Amsa, like he, he bought himself he bought himself all the space because Mewtwo King doesn't want to take damage. Um, so Mewtwo King, you know, opts to charge needles and he's willing to play the long stage game, but now Yoshi can get onto stage for free. Alright. Once again, um, Mewtwo King's only had two options in his shield. He's been going for desperation shield grabs and he's been jumping out of shield like 9 out of 10 times. So like he gets caught again here with the Nair. Unfortunately it trades. Once again, look how he jumped again. And now look, he's stuck in the air. And he's getting beat every time in these skirmishes. And he's very fortunate once again that that up smash didn't hit. So Alright, that was desperation by Amsa. It wasn't going to connect. Go. 
good egg to cover himself. All right. Anyway. A lot of just good punishes by Amsa. Like to be fair, like Amsa played this really well, but there were a lot of you know set decisions I think Mid King was set on um, from the get go. Um, that I think he this and we're mixing it up is important. Those um, jumps out of shield are probably one of the main reasons why Mid King lost the neutral a lot. So I'm done with this match. The last match I'm going to look at is um, Axe Zoo, um, and then I'll see if there's any match critiques that happened. Wait, I didn't know that you could change gear colors. Frick. I'm really sad. Anyway. And... So a couple of things that I'll give as a preface um, for this set. Um, Axis Punishment game was was not the best. Um, so I'm going to openly admit that Axis follow-ups were probably the greatest. But at the same time, I want to look at a lot of micro decisions that were made um, that were really smart from both players. Let's see if I could find some interesting things. All right, so I just want to just point out something there. All right, this is a standard. Uh, this is a standard uh, tech chase, um, where it's like kind of like getting chained on by. Um, by Falco. And this is where contingencies are important. So obviously, um, if you're in a pin down situation, you want to get the grab as Pikachu because you could chain grab. But look at what happens. Um, Pikachu knows that he Pika Axe isn't fully confident in the tech chase follow up just because of the odd position. So he aims to go for a jab to cover the tech in place instead of the roll. And sometimes that's really good to do. So if you know you're going to be late, um, throw out the quicker move, the low risk move, because um, at least you'll rack up damage and still pin them down. Uh, I, what I see a lot of people do, especially against Falco, this is like the most frustrating thing to do against Falco, is you go for a tech chase, you have all the advantage in the world, you go in for the tech chase, you grab, you're late, he spot dodges and shines, and then you're getting comboed and you die. It's like the worst feeling in the world. And so that's like one of the things that Falcos will spam because the reward for it is so high. And they're just gonna, it's kind of like, um, Spamming Shoryuken in online Street Fighter, it's like one of those, it's like one of those scrub tactics that just works. Um, and it works and I mean it's not the greatest and you can become predictable by doing it too much. But it just like it's just so good because it just gets you out of a bad position and can get you a really long combo. I just want to just point out little things too. 
So he wants to re-grab, and Zhu gets out. And for most people, so in this situation, he whiffs the grab, and Zhu manages to jump out. For most people, that would be the end of the combo, the end of the punishment. Um, but the thing about good players, an axe is so good at having a second option to cover if he misses the first option. So just like watch what axe does here. This is a really subtle thing, but this is one of the things that makes me really like go like wow, like axe like really knows like peak covering options really well. So he misses, Zoo will get out, but look at what axe does. He throws out a second U air. Um, Zoo has to go this way. And now he's stuck in shield with Pikachu at a subtle advantage. So although he didn't cover it there, like uh, you're covering a lot of options, and you're you're covering a lot of options, and you're throwing out many things. Like they're like little traps, and for very low low risk. All right. All right. This is an interesting decision here, and the reason why is because he's specifically covering the roll, and it's a reasonably safe thing unless like Falco can really react to it. It's a little bit janky, but if Pikachu in this jump state were to go on shield, Falco would be able to shine out a shield. So these are like little micro decisions that just really impress me about Axe, and it just really just shows like he knows his character. I'm gonna go to game five. Shout out to Ben TZ and D1 if you guys are here. Who's in the chat? Dingus Mask. Hey, you guys have like the worst names. The one thing I really like about um, um about um with about Zoo is that he's like really frustrating um, to play against. And look at how like he just maintains this amount of spacing, and he'll throw lasers knowing that he'll be safe in this distance to cover the near. Um, so this is one thing that I really like about Zoo is that he really knows zoning. So if you want to follow like a safe fundamental Falco that isn't just Doctor PP, like Zoo is one of those Falcos. Alright. So, one thing about um, that really stood out is like a lot of like subtle decisions about like not falling for traps. Um, Alright, so P this is the classic um, classic bad situation. You're stuck in shield and stun. Now, for most Falcos, or for most kit players, like especially new players, the ultimate temptation is to roll in. Um, and frankly, this is a trap set by X. He's going to hit the box and Falco's cornered. So the obvious thing is, well, he's, he's probably going to roll in because he's scared. But look at Zoo's discipline here. Instead, he goes for the other route and tries to gain stage control there. He's still stuck, but now. I mean, his stage position is not that much better, but at least he's, um, you know, facing the Pikachu to throw lasers out. And look at how he earned that from this position. All right, so he loses stage position here, but I just want you to show like just how much discipline Zhu has into not getting hit and um, regaining that control. So decides to go up because Pikachu is reading the roll. Um, Pikachu will try to cover this space, so Zoo will end up just going back down um, to a neutral state. Now he ha now he's facing Pikachu, and he has Pikachu and Shield. He jabs and he wins a neutral game. So it all pieced over from just having good discipline. And a lot of times in melee, um, at high level play, it won't take one, it'll take a series of smart decisions to go from a disadvantage to um, winning the neutral. And so, yeah. All right. 
All right, subtle decision here made by the Pikachu. Um, so, wow, Z is playing amazing. Axe is amazing, by the way. By the way, so there's something else here. Sorry, I'm like a little bit silent. So one of the, one of the basic things that um, most people can cover, and this is like one of the things that is really important, is learning to cover the roll in a corner because this is like something that everybody will always do. So like, Axe rolls, but Zoo's always ready to cover it because roll is laggy and so punishing a roll is like one of the most important things you can learn as a new player. Alright. So, anyway. Anyway, I'm done with this match. Anyway. Um, I have a couple of match critiques. Who is this? Gnarly? General tips on Fox. Okay, so that webcam is not me. It's of the, the people in the YouTube video. Um, just giving you a heads up. I was kind of confused and I was borderline scared right now because I was like, wait, who the hell is this guy in my, who the hell is this guy in, um, in the background? Like, I thought, I thought, um, that there was somebody in my room that wasn't me and I, I just panicked. Like, I was like, what the hell is this, like, camera doing here? Or like, I don't recognize those people. So, <laughs> um, so chillin' dude, Fox Luigi analysis. So, um, there is actually this really useful tutorial video, actually specifically on this matchup, and I highly recommend that you look at it. So. Dude, I'm not black. I'm 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 Asian. See? Anyway, um, so there is an amazing link by Chillin' Dude on how to play the specific matchup. Um, I hate playing against Luigi. Um, I this is why I don't like playing Sheridan in friendlies because he resorts to Luigi. Like Luigi is a very frustrating character that relies on Nair. And so I, yeah, I don't really like. I don't really like uh, Luigi. I, I said it. All right, I'm not doing bad so far. Yeah, you're playing. Am I? Am I am I critiquing Nick Knight or Crazy Knights? Yeah, my expertise is not really Luigi. Um, so once again, um, yeah, I, I apologize. Uh, but to be honest, there's like 
a 27 there's a 27 minute video that explains this matchup really well and conceptually I don't understand how to play against Luigi I mean if I were to point out a few things um, up throw up air should never work so don't go for that yeah um, you're going a little too frisky here um, yeah Oh, you shield drop, that's pretty sexy. That was a late on the... You were late on the follow-up. A lot of this is just being disciplined and always watching out for that low startup nair, in my honest opinion. But I don't know this matchup well enough to tell you anything. I mean, you could play this the, the I'm Fox and I beat you way by just, you know, spacing a lot of back airs and up tilts. Um, that seems to work really well. Alright. You got him cornered. What are you going to do in the corner? Oh, good down tilt. Oh, good discipline to wait on the nair. So, I mean, a lot of this matchup is just, you know, it's a game of chicken. You're waiting for them to throw out the nair, and then you're punishing them for the nair. And so... Um, I think the easiest way to explain it is um, you got nared. It's whether or not you got nared into a combo. Yeah, and back air is really good. Yeah, you're not doing bad at all. Yeah, you, you play that quite well. Yeah. Is it, do you just dominate this match? Alright. I think you're playing this really like you should. A lot of back airs, and just like putting them into a tough spot and just waiting for them to commit to something is, I think, how you should play it. Good recovery. Another good back air. So, yeah, I mean, I think between back air and util, like, this is a very. Oh, that was terrible. Yeah. I think, um, like, Luigi can do a lot of harm to players that don't know how to play against him, but I, it seems like you know what to do. I mean... I mean, you're drilling... I mean, I like your drills. Oh, you just tech flip back air? No. Uh, tape, TV lag? Oh, no. Well, so you died really... You kind of got gimped twice. I mean... Do you, do you lose this? The good back air? I, I feel like this is like one of the matchups where you just abuse priority on like three moves <laughs> and I think you're doing that pretty well another back air away from the recover you get fireball I don't know why you went for the near there to be honest that was so risky another good back air see I mean I feel like this match is just back air Yeah, alrighty. Yeah, it just seems like tech skill, and there are some questionable nairs that you did um, that were strong overcommitments. I think it's right here is like one of them. It should be coming up. Why? So that was a questionable nair, and so I think it just. I think it's just discipline, but you seem to have a good base plan in this matchup. I'm tying to Crazy Nux. I'm sorry, he's a Fox player.
Alrighty. Um. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um. Yeah. I um. That nair is bad because it it's gonna trade uh, no matter what. Luigi has active frames. And at that percentage, like, it's a potential for a combo. All right. Um, what else is there? I am not black. OK. Um, is there anything else? Is there any questions um, that you guys have for me? Um, I figure I should answer some questions. Yeah, I'm not black. Let's see if there's anything else that I had. Okay. Um, So how do I draw? So, um, let's see. Let me add a screen region on how to do this. So mini tutorial on how to add those little things. Okay, so to do the drawing things, um, you go to add, gosh dang it, all right, let's see. All right, one second. So to do the drawing board thing, there's something called a whiteboard overlay. Um, so you can just add a whiteboard and then this little menu box pops up um, and with that whiteboard overlay um, it's pretty straightforward so the basic commands are this so you can um, so on the For some reason, the whiteboard's not liking me. Let me lock it. OK. So um, you get, once you add it, you just set the width and the height. And um, you can draw like this. And then C on the top, C will show you a color box. So that's how you change colors. And if you want to delete all this, you just press escape. And if you want to fatten your marker tip, you can just keep typing A. And if you want to, so just TLDR, um, there's a whiteboard overlay, and it's pretty simple to use. I'm not going to do a shirtless stream. All right, let's see. I guess I'll show a little bit about tech chasing. Um, all right. I like uh, Unreal Tournament. I think this is one of my better matches to um, to tech chase, and I just wanted to show like what I, what um, I personally like to do. So my goal, 
my goal against Fox is like super jank. I, I like to find whatever means possible to to have a pin down situation. So that's why I kind of do really risky stuff. And I have a pin down. So my secret to tech chasing in general is um, I look at how the fox DI is and I always like to be facing the direction of the fox and I like to be in grab range. So the optimal distance for me would actually be slightly behind, like right here, where I can still grab the fox if he techs in place. So I always like to set myself up as a uh, or in the tech animation that I'm facing the sheik or I'm facing the fox. So this is my face. And what I do is this. You see this timer? I look at if this is really this is really stupid of me. I, I, I look I look and see like if this thing is moving relative to this timer and that's how I kind of align things and then if I see any movement between these two then I'll react so if I see any like movement between between these two then I know it's a tech roll it's basically reacting left or right but what I'm doing here in this position is I'm making it as simple as possible to react to what requires the fastest timing window so tech in place is the obvious hardest the hardest one to follow up in terms of timing windows and by having myself all prepped to cover that, all I need to do is press one button, and, and that's just grab. And so that's what that's how I space it. Um, anyway, so I'm covering this right away as my first um, option, and um, if I see any movement whatsoever, um, then I know it's a roll. And I'm gonna go tech. I'm gonna press left or press right based on it, and that's what I'm looking for. Now the fourth option is if they do a getup attack. Um, I'm not the greatest at covering this, and to be frank, it's really hard for me to react to everything. But what you can do as a contingency plan is um, you can hold down. So these are my inputs in this situation. You can hold down, and you can, and then you press um, Z. So, and the whole time you're inputting down, and the reason why is just in case you get get up attack, you can crotch cancel dash attack. So, um, that's a good input to cover everything. So, just to recap, um, step in the tech chase. The first step is always um, try to face the fox at a distance that you can grab. That should always be step one if you ever get in a pin down. Um, so once again, this is my way of doing it. Some people like to dash dance um, prep, and I think that might be slightly better. Um, hold down um, in case of missing and getting a get up attack happens. So I'm um, input down just in case, so that um, so just in case I get I get um I get get up attacked, I can throw out a dash attack and I'll beat it. It'll beat the I can, I'll crotch cancel the get up attack and I can dash attack right away and beat it. And then um, I use reference points to see if there is horizontal movement. And just react and you profit. Anyway. But so it's so hard. It's it's still really hard, and there's certain texts that are like really hard. But that's like how I tech chase.
But I want to show you. So there's part one. So if you if you miss. So I missed quite a bit, but um, the one thing that you want to do is, just in case you miss, you always want to maintain control. And that's one thing that I think most sheiks don't get, is that they assume perfection, like, oh, I have to get the tech chase every time. And if I miss, um, it's all over for me. I don't even have a second option. So like, at the very least, um, when I, if I do mess up, um, I'm so bad at this like thing. I should download the videos. Anyway. So I have a pin down here. I miss. F fortunately, I respace and I'm still like kind of in a pseudo advantage. And I still get the follow-up miss here. But I'm always, even if I don't get the follow-up, so for example, I didn't, I didn't get a direct hit here, but look at how I'm always positioned to get a second follow-up just in case, or that I maintain, maintain position. Anyway, I'm done with this subject. Alright, anyway. Okay, so... I'm probably going to transition it to... Oh my gosh, we got Kappa! Gryface Kappa! Ka Kappa Gryface Kappa! You, uh, subscribed. I'm happy for you. Kappa Gryface. Welcome to the family. Wait. No. I, I got trolled. F my life. Anyway, is there any other questions? I want to kind of transition it to PPU. Oh, okay. Dude, I got I got trolled really hard. Anyway, so I don't really have too much other than that. I mean, um, I mean, I'm going to transition in. I mean, Scarred Toph, are you guys still here? Is there any other concept that you guys want me to explore? Um, Lay Dash Grab sometimes is a bit clunky. Um, 